it's a great honor to be here, and it's um, a little bit intimidating, if you must know, uh, because APHRC has a 20-year history, and it's a very small organization that is based uh, in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, so we don't have 100 years under our belt, and we don't have um, hundreds of millions of dollars to solve global health problems. But we have big dreams, and uh, as an institution since establishment, our aim has been to see how we close that gap the gap of translation. And so I decided to speak about our work and everything that we're trying to do to see how do we narrow the gap between what we know, what the world knows, the knowledge system, and the action that the world deserves. So I've titled my talk uh, 17 to 4 years. And um, I come from the African continent, and every time I see these maps, it's almost like I took out the titles intentionally. It doesn't matter <laughs> what the issue is. Africa always looks the same, and not in a good way. And among these maps, there's a map that talks about NCDs, there's a map that talks about um, you know, life expectancy and many other issues. But for me, this is what keeps me awake. How do we change the world map so that Africa looks like other regions of the world in a good way? And down here, we have the, um, the uh, resilience, uh, and the res I mean, the, not the resilience, the opposite of resilience to climate change. So Africa is doing just as badly as the rest of the world. And on top of that, we have everything else that is there. So you can check out the maps and see where the NCDs lie and AMR, but for me, it's the same. And that's why maybe I'm an activist. So I have a few slides that talk about the NCDs, because as I've said, in this whole um, list of things that this partnership or this science uh, summit is about, NCDs, from where I sit, are the ones which are sort of on the side, where we don't get as much attention. And Africa, again, is doing badly. This is a slide that shows the percentage change from 2011 to 2019 in terms of mortality from NCDs. And almost all the African countries have changes ranging from maybe 30% to almost 70 or 80%. And compared to the rest of the world, of course, the rest of the world is not doing as well, but Africa is in there when it, when it comes to NCDs. And this is a graph that actually demonstrates the double burden of disease that Africa is facing, because these are the top 10 malaria endemic countries. And we see that in those countries, the death per 100,000 ranges from about 200 to about 300. Um, actually, about 400 in Mozambique. So NCDs, malaria is there, and NCDs are, you know, are getting into the uh, system as well. So as I've said, we have a crisis, of course. You have the poly crisis of all these issues. But from where I see it, we have another poly crisis. We have another problem, and that is the problem of translation. But before translation, I think we have a problem of inertia in policy and action. And uh, it's like we're s the ego has been circling up there, and it's finally patched next to us. And we still think that things can't be that bad. Whether it's in climate change, whether it's in NCDs, it's like we're, s we're happy that things are not going to be worse than they are, <laughs> that the ego is patched right next to us. And as I've said, related to the, the <laughs> inertia in policy and action, I think the translation gap. And this is a graphic which shows the values of death that innovations go through. So uh, university research institutes are churning out innovations daily, and some of them don't come out of the first valley, those that do don't come out of the second. But from the first stage of innovations to the actual practice, these are clinical innovations, that's where the 17 years are coming from. It takes an average of 17 years for innovations to move from when they are first, from the initial discoveries to action that actually impacts lives. This is an analysis that is a little bit dated, it's from 2011. I tried to look for an updated one, and the one I got says it's actually not 17, it's 14 years. And I'm asking myself, OK, does it matter we, where we are right now? I came from Nairobi, and we're underwater. Do we have time to find innovations and wait for 14 years for them to be translated before we can deal with the climate crisis? And the answer is no. So this is another problem about the translation gap. The fact that the number of scientific papers every year is going up. 2022, more than 5 million papers were published. Tedros, this is a graph, this is a chart I stole from um, the WHO policy, evidence to policy summit, which shows that in applied health, applied health research, only 14% of research is actually translated into policies, programs, 
or technologies. This is in applied health. So in other fields of health, I don't know what the percentage is, because if applied is 14 percent, it's perhaps two or three or four or five percent in other fields of health. And yet the number of papers are going up by millions every year. So that's the question. Now, this is another dimension of the translation gap, and this is one of my favorite papers all time. Bill has an all-time favorite graph. This is my all-time favorite paper. And it talks about the uses of knowledge in global health. And what, it's, a, it's a very, very insightful paper. But the summary is that the majority of knowledge in global health is used solely for citation. Academics are five meters above ground, and they are citing science amongst themselves. And everybody else is, you know, ground level. And when the knowledge escapes from this vortex created by academics, it gets to global health institutions, gets to governments in national capitals, and it gets to parliament. Rarely does knowledge get to the frontline workers, whether they are healthcare workers, whether they are people leading, you know, primary healthcare facilities, doesn't get to communities, does not get to activists. Shea Bimbola, the author of this paper, categorizes professors, academics, and then um, engineers, those are the technocrats. He talks about plumbers, those are the grassroots, frontline uh, providers, where the healthcare workers, and he talks about the emancipators, who are the activists. So the translation gap actually is a result of the fact that the knowledge stops in academia, when it escapes, it stops at the global level, the national level, and does not get to the ground, where people on a daily basis are making life and death decisions. So what are we doing? What are the opportunities as the African Population and Health Research Center? So I think our secret weapon as Africa, I think, is our experts. The question is, where are those experts? And we know where they are. And the second is, of course, the opportunities presented by technologies, you know, like data science and machine learning and AI, and how perhaps we have an opportunity to leapfrog and narrow down the 17 years to four years. And then the last, still technology-driven platforms to try to bring to you, to your laptop, the African expert. So the first, I wanted to meet Hadiza. Hadiza is a professor of, of obstetrics at the Bayero University in Kano State, Nigeria. She's an accomplished researcher. She was one of the um, investigators on the emotive trial that showed how you can actually reduce uh, postpartum hemorrhage by 60% in women by using a very simple set of tools. So she has a New England Journal of Medicine paper under her belt, very highly accomplished. But she's also a trusted partner, not just for her students, for her community. She's working with local communities. And actually, the translation of the work, WHO has already changed the guidelines based on this work. I think it took about six months. But in, within Nigeria, several states have already ad adopted the guidelines for managing postpartum hemorrhage as a result of the outreach, the partnership with local communities in translating what is known you know, from, the, from the lab, from the clinical setting into action. Now, Hadiza is also working on an initiative to set up um, a surveillance system for maternal newborn and child health in Kano State at the request of the government of Kano. And we do, it's still early days, but this is the kind of trusted partner, the translation champion, that we think the world needs. Now, the second, this is an initiative, actually, coincidentally, a partnership between APHRC and Welcome, that is trying to see how do you bring together different communities, people with mental illness, lived experiences, clinicians that work on mental health, epidemiologists, data scientists, and activists. How do you bring all of them together to co-create solutions and then use data science as a tool to gain insights in a way that is faster, in a way that is um, easier, and maybe do things that are not possible with the classical approach to science, so that we can actually generate innovations and solutions that are going to deal with mental health issues among young people on the African continent. So it is how we do science and who does science. It's not just us, the epidemiologists and you know, data scientists. It's bring everybody together to design solutions. Because once these solutions are developed, the activists are there, the lived experiences are there, the clinicians are there, it's different than us you know, designing solutions in our labs or in our, uh, you know, in our research institutions. 
The last point I'll talk about, about the opportunity, is to how to find the African expert. Because as I've said, the world needs accomplished African researchers. We need African experts. We need proximate partners that are on the ground. We need trusted partners for government, for civil society, for communities, and we need translation champions. And what we are doing, coming soon to a laptop near you, is this African Research Connect, where you'll be able to find the African expert that you're looking for. Because African experts, as I've said, they are invisible. Most of you have never met Hadiza. There are hundreds of thousands of Hadizas out there that are waiting to be met and to partner and create solutions. So this is a platform that has lots of functionalities, but critical among them is that we've been able to bring about seven million records in about six months using AI and machine learning into this platform. And it's the most comprehensive platform that has all the science that has been done on the African continent. It has institutional profiles. You can go in there and look for an institution, look for an individual, based on country, based on institution, based on area. And we think that African scientists, we are bringing them, as I said, to your laptop, so you can find them, find the Hadizas that are there, and then let's co-create magic. So this is just an example, climate change, uh, for instance, institutions. This is Hadiza. You know, if you put the name Hadiza, she comes up on top because she's very highly accomplished. And so this is a platform where you can actually see who are the trusted partners who are working in several areas, what is their experience, what kind of institutional profiles do they have. So in sum, I think addressing the poly crisis will require different ways of doing science. And it requires of us to narrow down the translation gap from 17 years to four years. It requires us to do science differently, to invest in proximate partners, credible, trusted, translated translation champions, to invest in translation research itself, but also in research and translation. And our commitment as the African Population Research Center is to help you find the African proximate, trusted translation champion. I thank you very much for your attention and, and wish uh, all of you a very good two days. Thank you very much. <laughs>